Good afternoon, Dr. Scott Tinker. Thank you very much for doing this. I really appreciate your time. You bet, Trevor. It's great to be with you. For the listener, you are the founder and chairman of the Switch Energy Alliance, but to help paint a picture, how would you describe yourself? <laughs> well, I'm a geologist by training and, and still run a big research unit at UT, 250 people, UT Austin. Been there 24 years and actually was in the energy industry for 17 years before that. So filmmaker and and PBS host and just do a lot of things around the energy education space, trying to help people digest this complicated world of energy. What is the Switch Energy Alliance? It's a not-for-profit. Uh, we started uh, film-based. I met a filmmaker, Harry Lynch, many years ago, and we made a film together in 2009 and 10, pro post-produced in 11 and released it in 12 on the energy transition 13 years ago. So it was kind of out there. We went to about a dozen countries all over the world and looked at where energy was best in the world and some of the challenges of all forms of energy. So that got us going. And we, one thing led to another. And so we've been doing... Uh, energy filmmaking and environmental energy and environment PBS shows and, and classroom materials and museum films and all sorts of stuff since then. So it's a, it's a very fun not-for-profit that tries to inspire an energy educated future in our world. If I'm correct, you're a geologist by training. How did you get into the energy industry and why energy? Yeah, I got out of school and, went back to school and went to work uh, in the oil and gas business in the eighties, which a lot of folks did then and ended up in the research side of it for the most part. So building computer models of subsurface oil and gas reservoirs and the really early computer models, which was a blast. In the late nineties, I left to go to the university of Texas. They were closing the research labs, and stayed in energy and built this big research entity down there a very large entity and we work all over the world but energy impacts so many facets of our lives so i've just kind of expanded into looking at all forms of energy and and how they interact with all forms of environment and the economy so it's complicated space but fun you know very tangible and and practical and touches lots of lives i thought today for the purposes of this conversation we could structure it around a quote unquote, non-political discussion around the highlights of your energy climate conundrum mm -hmm. presentation to maybe highlight a few of the key points for the listener, one of which being your statements on energy being completely factual and factually complete in your presentation and what that means to the listener. But what does that mean? What is completely factual and factually complete in the energy context? Right. Yeah, I was asked to testify to Senator Joe Manchin's first climate hearing two years ago and did that in, in Washington. And there were four witnesses. I was one of four. Lots of things were being said that were factual. Right? So let's call that completely factual statements. But they weren't factually complete in a sense of the listener or the policymaker or the media person in the room might be left with an impression of something that wasn't incorporating other components of that dialogue or conversation. So you can oversimplify to the point of being somewhat uh, misleading. And, and that happens, you know, cherry picking, some people call it. But I try my best to be factually complete, which is impossible. Nobody can be factually complete. And we don't have all the info and ever will. But uh, it's really important to try. And, and this happens across the environmental space and energy space. And I'm sure it happens in other areas that I'm not an expert, agriculture and high tech and, and uh, you know, pharmacy and everything else. So that's the goal is really to be as factually complete as we can. Not binary. Another way to think about that might be binary. Black and white, clean and dirty, good and bad, these kinds of words. Well, the energy world is not that. It's... It's got a lot of components to it and can be quite nuanced actually, but importantly nuanced. So you got to look at the multifaceted, multivariate aspects of that in order to try to accomplish some of the things that we're all hoping to do. 
not cherry picking data in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to cherry pick and then and then use that to persuade. Hans Rosling wrote a beautiful book called Factfulness. He was a medical doctor from Sweden, passed away before it was finished. His kids finished it. Um, buried in the last chapter of that book was a sentence I remember. Data should be used to tell the truth, not to call to action, no matter how noble the intentions. And we need to think about that as how to use data in a way that is, you know, try to tell some sense of truth. Nobody owns the truth. There's no patent on truth. Just keep seeking it. But we got to try our best to be as complete as we can. When it comes to energy, what would be an example of a factually incomplete statement? Is there something that comes to mind when you present to audiences that really paints a picture of how maybe energy is portrayed factually oh, yeah. incomplete? Oh, yeah. They're, they're endless. <laughs> um, I'll give you a couple. Scale use me. Scale often can do that. You might see something like or hear something like China is the world leader in solar and wind production. And that's mm -hmm. completely factual. They passed Europe and they passed the US. So it's completely factual. More people. But as you so, okay, well, what does that mean? Let's scale solar and wind production in China down to compare it to all of their electricity production. And it turns out it's maybe 10 to 15 percent of that. And then when you scale it down to all of China's energy production, because electricity is only a piece of energy, usually about 20 percent, it's a couple percent. So China's energy is this giant growing thing, and 2% is solar and wind, but they're the world's leader in solar and wind. So if all you said was China is the world's leader and they passed Europe and the US, someone might go away thinking, wow, China's killing it in solar and wind, and they are. But what does that mean relative? <laughs> okay, and so scale matters. Another example, we had a big storm here a couple of years ago called Winter Storm Uri in Texas, February of 21. Killed people, blackouts. Uh, what you read from that analysis or in the analysis of academics and even the federal organizations was natural gas was to blame. It fell 40 percent. And that's when the blackout started. That's a completely factual statement. What would make it factually complete? Well, let's look at the six days going into the blackouts, which were all below freezing. Mm -hmm. And what was happening? Well, the solar went away. The wind went away. Coal was cranking full tilt, nuclear full tilt. Natural gas was growing day on day to more than double what it was in its normal winter state. No blackouts yet. This is six days of this. And day seven on Valentine's Day mm -hmm. continued to be really cold. A coal pile froze, a nuclear reactor pump froze. Those, some of those went offline. Natural gas fell 40% from someplace that was over 200% more than it normally is. So it was still way above normal but it did fall. So you start to look at a little more factually complete analysis and say, well, everything didn't perform great, but I sure wouldn't want to be without natural gas <laughs> in mm -hmm. that time. And otherwise you might think, well, gas fell 40% and it was to blame for the blackouts. So, you know, you have to really start to dig in a little deeper to these kinds of things to, to understand what's going on. And so you can try to address them. Of all the examples you have, is there a gap between completely factual and factually complete? Maybe the China example, is there one that is the biggest gap between the two that comes to mind? Or is there one that sticks out that you like to point towards? Um, it's more of a continuum. I think you see varying stages of this. Um, in the climate world, this isn't the biggest gap, but depending on what you read and what the press portrays, you might read that forest fires in Canada were as bad as they've ever been last summer, completely factual, mm -hmm. and the world is on fire. Okay, well, you go look at the data, and depending on what you're looking at, forest fire intensity or acreage burned or a variety of things globally, actually, fires have been coming down for 20 years globally. But there are some places in the world where it's really bad. And so you don't want to be left with the impression that climate is burning up the earth mm -hmm. if we're actually managing them better than we ever have. And I would say, 
in climate, particularly the impacts of climate change, depending on what you're getting, where you're getting your information, often portrayed as as bad as they've ever been. When in fact, as you start to look at these things, the deaths from climate are down. There's the coastal impacts because of because of humans' ability to adapt to these things. We're continuing to do that, so we're managing some of those impacts. So it's not that one is wrong and right or anything's being misrepresented. It's just that the complexity of the story is often lost if you're not a deep expert or if you're getting a single source of news or two that you like to read because it agrees with you. <laughs> and we all know we're right. So all I want to read is stuff that agrees with me and it makes me feel better each day. Well, you know, read some things that you don't agree with and think, well, why are they thinking that? Instead of thinking, boy, they're an idiot. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't agree with me. They must be a denier or some in the shill of the industry or something like that. And these kinds of terms that come in, maybe ask the question, well, what is it they're thinking and seeing since we're all trying to do reasonable things for this world? Uh, I, I give people a lot of benefit of the doubt that way. So, you know, big gaps. Um, China has some, uh, Germany has some good intentions, but, you know, you would think <laughs> there's a gap. When Mr. Putin cut off the natural gas to, to Europe, <laughs> and invaded the Ukraine. Germany had a lot of that gas coming in and had built some of their economy around it. Germany started firing up coal power plants again mm -hmm. and then continued to shut down their full nuclear reactor fleet for generating electricity. So this is, this is challenging and the climate scientists were upset by this, rightfully so. I mean, we've got this nuclear reactors generating zero emissions and we're going to shut those down and fire up the coal. So I think the German people probably get some completely factual components of that dialogue, but not the whole story as they're trying to think through it. And the result of that is emissions are up again in Germany, not where they were, but have trended back up again. And in a lot of Europe, electricity has gotten very expensive because not everybody can afford to compete with Germany for coal and other sources. So it has ramifications. It's not little things. These are big things um, that, that we deal with uh, and have to really think hard about. To flip that on its head on the other side, are there any aspects of energy that seem to be in harmony with facts, both factually and factually complete? Do you see examples where everything lines up and that maybe certain policies are, are correct and it makes sense yeah. to you? Yeah, yeah, I think policy is vital. You know, I think this blend of governments and markets are critical to make things work. Where is it working? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd say in the Obama administration, not by intent so much, but in the U.S., we had a massive energy revolution from about, oh, 2005 to 15 in there. We we under, figured out shale, and it had started earlier than that, but what does figure out mean? How to extract natural gas and oil from these shales, which are very hard rocks that are hard to extract liquids and gases from. Got to crack them. It changed the whole U.S. scene and the world. We went from importing a bunch of oil to having the capacity to export oil. This is a massive change. Mm -hmm. And same with natural gas. It made natural gas very affordable. $3 an MCF and 1,000 cubic feet instead of dancing between $5 and $15, which it had been the decade prior. And then distributed the balance of energy control broader globally. So it wasn't just in the hands of OPEC. All of a sudden, the U.S. was a player again, and you start to see some more reasonable dialogue. So the Obama administration, this happened during that administration. Again, not necessarily by intent, mm -hmm. but they didn't fight it either. You know, they kind of quietly supported a few things, pushed on a few things, but let the industry go with that. So, and let the states regulate it, continue to give that. And states have a lot of authority here in the U.S. It's where we have state, a lot of state authority. Um, so that's an example of something working quite well. Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, we're trying to change that now and, and perturb it by over-regulating some of the and they won't be able to deliver on some of that stuff. And we'll be right back in the position where Europe is today from regulating things so hard. That I think that's a pretty nice example of governments. It's in that case, a democratic administration 
working federally in the federalist system. Big, big, probably the fastest energy transition in the world in a decade that happened, doubling the production of oil, more than doubling the production of energy. Now it's plateauing, Trevor. The sales are starting to flatten and plateau. And you said you worked in the energy industry a little bit yourself, and uh, it's starting to plateau. So that things don't last forever, especially if you don't support them. To what degree do you think the free markets played in that success of the balance and energy policy and success? Was it yeah. was it large largely in part due to that, or what no, was it, it? Yeah, I mean the investments came from markets. The investments came from the industry. A lot of them lost their ass. <laughs> yeah. You know, they were learning <laughs> how to do this, and they were destroying capital faster than you can imagine. <laughs> And people, companies went out of business. The, the the measure of success then was just keep increasing production. Drill, drill, drill. Keep increasing production. And they did that. But a lot of that production, as they were trying to figure out these complicated rocks that they had never produced from, was uneconomic. So investment was pouring in, but it was losing money. Increasing oil, decreasing dollars. That's not a great long-term strategy. So the markets played a role. The markets corrected all of that. And then now you see a lot more fiscal discipline in that industry where they are not, even though the price is going up again and it always goes up and it always goes down depending on world politics as well. Uh, they're not overdoing it. They're just saying, yeah, we're going to continue to con do our best here, but not try to tear out or strip off the rents from the high prices now. Just keep going. Prices will go down again, but let's be here next year as well. So I think markets had a big role to play in that. So did governments. Uh, prior to that, not many people talked about this, but the Department of Energy had put a lot of money into doing research and failed through some of the labs and the universities. A lot of the early learning to be able to do that production when George Mitchell was trying to crack the nut from the 1980s and 90s, right? Uh, there was federal money going into that, too, to help understand the complexity of that, both the geologic and engineering complexity. So federal investments helped, played a big role, and, they, and it continues to. So I think that's a pretty healthy partnership. I think another one is, is wind and solar has been um, increasing their market share. Now, it's not big, but they've been growing exponentially for quite a while now. From a very small start, uh, federal money has gone into that. State money has gone into that through various renewable portfolio standards and direct subsidies, and that's had an impact. But the industry is taking risks as well. It's kind of like the shale business, though. It's hard to make money in solar and wind. Mm -hmm. you, you hear they're cheaper, and that's true, completely factual. <laughs> At the plant gate, solar and wind costs have come way down. The challenge is getting it to yeah. consumer, you and me, because it's not always there. The sun and the wind are not always there. You, you need something else there and complement. And that, that complementary thing, whether it's a big battery or a backup natural gas plant or something, sits there idly, redundantly, and then it turns on when you need it. So you have double the infrastructure in order to be able to produce reliable electricity. That makes it more expensive to the consumer. So I would say, again, that's an area it has worked in wind and solar, but at some point now, governments have to decide when to let the markets take over and compete and when to continue and how to continue to subsidize industry. Industries don't like subsidies go away once they're there. <laughs> you know, hey, keep them coming. So you might hear we're competitive, we're cheaper than coal and gas and everything on one hand. And then in the exact same hand, the same people are saying, but we need the subsidies. And that gets confusing. You know, because if you hear those two things, why is that? So, but good partnerships for sure. The Earth's, the Earth's climate is a complex system. The ego of man likes to fit narratives into precision and make models and try and explain things and there's a lot of hubris that goes into it. To what extent do you think the climate models have been accurate or inaccurate the last, say, decade in predicting 
climate outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, look, I'm not a climate modeler. Um, I understand paleoclimate because I'm a geologist but, and have studied it. But look, it's a brutally hard problem. Let's just set that up front. It's multivariate. Uh, the equations are nonlinear. It's complex. So it's a complex, multivariate, nonlinear set of problems with a lot of feedback loops that we try to understand. But you're trying to model a whole Earth system. This is brutal, okay? Uh, the math is complicated and the physics is complicated. The models have done a good job direction, I think, of, of shining a light on what can happen with different components of the inputs varying. And that includes carbon dioxide and methane, two greenhouse gases along with water vapor and other things. So they've done a nice job of saying, hey, if we keep putting emissions into the atmosphere, things are going to continue to warm some. Now, the best models in the world, when you look at their forecasts out into the future, there's quite a range of outcomes. Each model has a different outcome and each modeler has a different set of things they do. So mm -hmm. you put all those out there, it looks kind of like a horsetail. Directionally, they're going up, but there's, there's a, quite a range in the prediction of the future in each set. So the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, has uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has, looks at these things and gathers some of the best scientists and puts out, I think it's four scenarios. Everybody use these input scenarios and give us your best model. And, and then there's these horse tails, four different sets of horse tails, one being the most extreme and then coming, kind of coming on down from that. Sort of. And they've done a nice job, I think, of making us aware of what the temperature could do. As hard as that sounds, the harder thing <laughs> is to understand what are the impacts of that temperature? Mm -hmm. What does it do to storm intensity and storm frequency and drought intensity and drought frequency and forest fire intensity and area burn and frequencies counts and sea level rise and its rate of acceleration ocean acidification, some of the big things we study and worry about, the impacts of climate change, what are those gonna look like? And this is a hard, hard problem. There, there are different looks at that uh, and they're okay, but it's tough. It's tough to truly fully understand that. And I think people get frustrated, even they'll get frustrated by me saying, okay. Mm -hmm you're gonna minimize people's confidence in what we need to do. Well, no, I don't think so. Exactly. I think exactly. people need to hear that there's a range of possibilities and we need to work on it. Part of that is going to be trying to mitigate some of those and adapt to some of those. And, and part of it could be they're not as bad as we think, or they could be worse. And another piece is it's gonna be okay in some parts of the world and not in one aspect might be better rainfall it's more intense well some arid regions might appreciate that and others may not mm -hmm. uh, ice melting well northern russia and canada and greenland you know depending on where you live you might be okay to have more irrigable land winners and losers happen with change and and so this is the this is the real struggle i think we all have is some want to simplify it to a point to communicate this message of of extreme risk. Mm -hmm. And that is one set of scenarios, but it's not the only set. And I'm more interested in having people understand these complexities and realizing that there are things we can do to mitigate and adapt. But we also don't want to do those at the exclusion of other really important things like continuing to invest in energy so that people living in poverty in the world who need energy aren't cut off from it for another several decades. Mm. And I've traveled the world and studied this part of it. I have studied energy poverty quite deep. So so that's the challenge, I think, with these really complicated models is, is making sure we act on them appropriately, not underreact, but not overreact. Mm. Nassim Taleb would 
comment that in a complex complex system, it's incumbent upon the person tampering with it to take precaution. From that perspective, do you think it's possible for energy to develop to exist with a complex system? Can we balance the two? And and if so, how do you how do you go about? What's your suggestion to do that? Yeah. I love his work and Black Swan and other things. I, I think uh, um, I've heard the analogy of insurance. Well, let's just buy a bunch of insurance. Uh, it depends on how much that insurance cost. You know, I'm in a home and it has a value of $100. If the insurance is $100 a year, maybe I don't want to do that because it, basically in one year I could have replaced it myself. Mm -hmm. And, and so we have to start to think about the economic components of that and also um, who they affect the most. Mm -hmm. and, and so my, my response to that in general is of the 8.4 billion souls on earth today, only a couple billion of us have the kinds of lives we lead that you and I are leading right now, and even the ability to do this remotely. And another six billion don't. <laughs> Three quarters of the world, severe energy poverty, economic poverty on up through some transition to, and so they need energy. Uh, energy, I've said many times for many years now, energy won't end poverty. You can't end poverty without energy. Mm -hmm. It's a dilemma. It's a conundrum. The world needs energy, and and much of the world doesn't have reliable energy. So where are they getting it? Same place as the highly wealthy developed world got it from coal and currently from wood and mm -hmm. dung and other biomass, coal, and then slowly transitioning. Maybe they have some hydro, big dams they can build and wind turbines and solar they could put up in distributed ways, but they need it. They need it. And they and it's not just for them. It's not some altruistic statement I'm making. I think for the betterment of the world and its economic health, that's important. Mm -hmm. As you grow your healthy economy, it allows you to do something very important that most of us don't relate to that. That's invest in the environment. Exactly. The worst environments on the planet are where it's poor. The dirtiest water, the, the most polluted soils, the local air where people are dying from breathing particulates in their own home. So that's what that allows. It, it allows economies to grow and begin to invest in environmental protection and now the whole world is thinking about it and afford to protect at different levels the environment. So energy poverty impacts the environment. Yeah. The safe and reliable energy is directly correlated to the quality of life in the developed world. Absolutely. It is. If you go back and you don't have to go that far, even my grandparents, and look at the change in Almost everything we measure for quality of life, they've gotten better. Mm -hmm. Now they're starting to show some effects. Maybe we're kind of hitting the margins in the rich world. But as you work your way down into ever less advantaged parts of the world, those things don't exist. Yet. Mm -hmm. One of the really interesting things I've been looking at recently, uh, Trevor, is population again. And if you put the the countries of the world onto a plot that shows a wealth across the bottom on the x-axis for wealth against fertility rates. <laughs> this guy's going to talk about fertility rates? Yes, I am. You know, it's important because population growth is one of the big drivers of all these consumptive things in the world. We consume more the more people we have. Mm -hmm. So fertility rates against wealth. What you see is the wealthiest nations in the world have the lowest fertility rates. And as you get poorer and poorer, those fertility rates are higher and higher. Now you go back and compare 30 years ago to today, all the countries' fertility rates are coming down mm -hmm. and they're moving sort of toward the wealthier side. They're not wealthy. They're still very poor, many of them, but they're moving that direction. A 2.1 fertility rate is called the replacement rate. It's it allows population to stay stable, okay? You'd be amazed at how many countries are below that. China's at 1.2. Mm -hmm. 
half of that almost. And India hit 2.1 just last year. India. So you're starting to see this trend of population growth slowing and the potential for it to go flat. And this has demographers and economists all on a Twitter because they don't know what to do if we're not growing. What do we, you know? What's the measure of good, of value, of quality if it's not growth? Yeah. And so this is going to be a fascinating dialogue to play out over the next many decades. But I'd say those trends of wealth and lower fertility rates are good for humans and they're good for the planet. And that's why I'm so impassioned by continuing to help with the with that economic growth part, which needs energy to do that. Does that make sense? Did I describe that reasonably well? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think you're preaching in the choir on that subject, but for the listener, it's sometimes helpful to explain it in um, simple examples where, in fact, the undeveloped world is much dirtier without the use of fossil fuels. Has that been one example that you have found yeah. to to help explain some of the realities? Yeah, yeah. That's a, it sounds like an irony. Yeah. But fossil fuel, the the dirtiest soils, the dirtiest water, the most polluted water, the dirtiest air is where it's poor. Mm -hmm. Okay, the cleanest of all those is where it's rich. And there are a lot of fossil fuels there. Why? Because we have healthy economies, we have regulatory systems, and we clean them up. We can afford to. So this is that, that's a, that sounds like a, a paradox, but it's not really. Mm -hmm. They're very, very tightly understood and and uh, important to accomplish as we go forward. If you presented the question on whether you'd want a greener planet, most people would agree that's the ideal outcome, but it's just a question of how we get there. To what extent do you think transition fuels like natural gas play a role in that? Yeah, it's a huge one. I'm not even sure I would use transition for natural gas. And I think it's going to be around a very long time. Methane. Right. But when people say natural gas, mostly they mean methane, CH4, carbon four hydrogens. There's propane and butane, methane, and all sorts of other carbon and hydrogen mixes in natural gases. Um, but we know some of the things we do with methane, probably the public would understand we burn it to make electricity, burn natural gas, boil water, mm -hmm. make steam, turn a turbine, run a generator, make electricity. We burn coal, we burn wood. Nuclear makes heat, blah, blah. That's how it's all done. But we do so much more with that. Yeah. You, know, you, can, you can use it to get hydrogen, and hydrogen is a great fuel. Um, you, it, it burns itself, but without CO2 emissions. You can put hydrogen in fuel cells for vehicle transportation, so it's an electricity carrier of sorts. Mm -hmm. It basically is like a battery, but a different kind. We have to have methane for uh, ammonia, which is one of the leading compounds we need or, or, or you know, chemistries we need for fertilizers to grow all the agriculture. Methane is vital for plastics. You know, and you may say, well, I don't want plastics. Well, they're everywhere in our lives. And what you use instead of plastics that has the same light weight and strength and all that. And so I could keep going on and on about methane but i think it's going to be here importantly for a very long time and that's a good thing you know we're, it it has lower co2 emissions when you burn it than coal mm -hmm. it doesn't have the sulfur and the socks and the nitrogen knox and mercury and particulates that come from burning something solid like wood coal or even oil so it's, it's much cleaner in an air and and uh quality sense other than the CO2 component and methane leak methane itself is a greenhouse gas so you got to the CO2 and, and methane you got to make sure to continue to lower those emissions from that process and there's companies working on that there's a company called net power that's trying to do you know basically clean methane uh, low emissions methane let me use the right word you know cutting mm -hmm. down the emissions methane so I think it's a huge piece of our future and needs to stay there for quite a long time. In the Western world, it's easy to, to be complacent or it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. When explaining the gap between rich and poor and the energy poverty that exists, is there an example that you find that helps explain it to people? Is it the lurid? Is it the gruesome? Is there 
is there a sort of like an example you point towards starving people that really helps explain what we're talking about? Because in the Western world, it just seems like you can, it's out of sight, out of mind, but how, yeah. how, is, is there an example that you use that seems to work better? There are many. And, and again, we made a film on many countries. Let me throw one out that might be unexpected. Um, the Economist put out a piece not long ago that said expensive energy probably killed more people than COVID in Europe. Hmm. Now, who would have thought? In Europe, in the Western world. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it was heat or eat for some people there. This is why energy, the, the cost of energy is a very regressive, it has a very regressive economic. Exactly. Economy. If I'm paying a lot for gasoline, I'm rich. I can afford expensive gasoline. I don't like it, but I'll do it. Same with heating or air conditioning. The less I make, the more proportionally of my income is spent on energy. Mm -hmm. And it gets to be quite extreme for the poorest among us. And they're literally having to make decisions about things. So this is an example of not really poor people over there. Oh, well, you know, I don't know about them. This is right in our own backyard. The U.S. has it too mm -hmm. in a big way. So now kind of come down through that scheme. Let's come down from that to intermittent energy, unreliable energy. So electricity's on and then it's off for four hours. I didn't know when. And it's back on for an hour and then off. And it's the winter time or it's the summer time. And I'm trying to study. I'm a student, first generation in college, but I can't study because it's blackouts. You know? So 4 billion people in the world, approximately, have unreliable energy. Yeah. It's not there for them predictably. And that's a huge challenge when it comes to the energy poverty world. And now I'm coming down into the kind of the bottom 2 billion who have little to no energy. They, they literally are cooking over dung or wood inside their homes if they can get that. That's expensive to them because it's a deforestation. They, they don't have light, or electricity access, and maybe they use a token. I'll give you an example. We visited a large slum in Africa called Kiba outside of Nairobi. And there you buy a token to put into a meter and you get one hour of electricity if you can afford the token. So in that hour, do everything you can. If you're running a sewing machine, do that. If you want to cook over an induction cooktop, do that. If you want some light to read at night to study, you get that hour, and then it's gone again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are, this is something most of us just don't understand. Mm -hmm. And then I go even to more severe poverty, and, and it, it, people don't live long. Exactly. They live 40, 45, 50 years still. We're living 80 here. In this world today, at the same exact time, there's almost double the age still. Mm -hmm. and, and all the health that goes along with that. I'm not an overly uh, moralistic creature, but I I find something morally wrong about that. In my world. I just, I just, you know, I, I have trouble processing because it, it, it's solvable. Mm -hmm. Humans respond to incentives. The proponents of the something like the carbon tax would be that you need a stick to disincentivize people from using carbon-based products. But on the other hand, the critic would say it's regressive, where it disproportionately impacts poorer people and they pay the higher price. To what degree do you think the carbon tax have been a burden on the poorer elements or the less advantaged elements of yeah. society? Most places don't have an outright tax. A few do, but they tax it <laughs> in different ways. So at the end of the day, there's a price coming on carbon in a variety of ways. New York City has one. It's not called that, but they're requiring all of the buildings to be electrified by this law that was passed a few years back, which means you got to get rid of all the natural gas in the building. It's incredibly expensive. And everybody living in the building has to pay. So... This is regressive. Um, I, I, w I wrote a piece on this several years ago and my opinions haven't evolved that much from then. I think I put it out in Scientific American or Forbes, I can't remember where, on the carbon tax. 
if you knew that the tax was going to go to work on addressing the issue that it was put there for, reduction in actual carbon emissions, and not be distributed among a bunch of people that we like or or used in some other way, like often federal taxes are, like there's a tax to put away nuclear waste in the U.S. and nothing's ever been put away. Mm -hmm. So the tax, which is a lot of money cumulative, has gone to all sorts of other special projects. So I'm a little bit skeptical that taxes get used for what they're intended. The other thing I worry about is the world is competing now. We get half of our stuff from Asia. Mm -hmm. We, the rich world. Why? I mean... Doesn't it cost more to make it there, put it on a train, do a ship, ship it across, do another train, do a truck, to a store, to my car, to my house? I mean, can't that possibly be more expensive than just making it right there? Uh, no, it's not. It's cheaper. And so, but the energy equation of that little nightmare is incredible. The amount of energy to do all those things, to get that toothbrush delivered to my house on Amazon truck, you know, one toothbrush. It's stupid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. It's crazy thinking. So, but we're doing that. Yeah. So I think um, parts of the world, we're essentially saying to Asia, make my stuff cheap, use coal, because that's the affordable, reliable thing, and then just give it to me and I'll be green and you be dirty, but it's not my problem, I'm green. And, well, it is your problem because there's one atmosphere and you're passionate about climate change. It's all going up into the same atmosphere, which, by the way, circulates things pretty efficiently. Mm -hmm. So it's not addressing climate change, which is moving the problem to places that don't have the regulations that we do. So this is this is the challenge of carbon taxing. If the world doesn't do it, only some, it's going to be disproportionately impactful. People talk about a border tax to mitigate for those. Okay, I just made an interesting graph last week. I showed the trade between India and China over the last 15 years. Mm -hmm be kind of in parity. India is importing a hundred billion dollars worth of stuff, goods from China now, and exporting 10. Mm -hmm. And that's grown from 10. So China has this huge market in India now, 1.4 billion people to sell stuff to. They may not even need Western Europe someday soon for mm -hmm. their markets. Who knows? Put on your border tax. All right, well, we'll just sell our thing over here. Good luck. And who who really controls at that point in time? Right? And who really is driving? Who, what's the chicken and what's the egg? The cart and the horse in that little scenario. We're very used to thinking in a currently static way. Linear. But all those dynamics are changing. Yeah. The, in terms of the regressive nature of the taxes, it's easy to say when you've got a million dollars that the carbon tax is fair, but when you only make 50 grand a year, you pay a way higher price in terms of filling up your car. Do you think that is a good way to go about that problem or is there better solutions? I don't think it'll work. You know, I, I, I don't know if it's good or bad. I just don't think it will have the kind of impact on actual climate that we think it might. Mm -hmm. And therefore you're gonna, again, disadvantage the poorest among us. Some have talked about redistribution. so. You tax and then you give the poorest people money back or tax breaks in order to do that. It gets pretty complicated. Exactly. And a lot of gaming goes on and the tax code goes on and accountants love it and lawyers love it and everybody else kind of gets stuff. <laughs> so what's a better way? Uh, it's hard. You have to have, you have to throw several levers, technology, certain technologies to lower actual emissions at the right price and the right scale. So it can't be a little bit. There's some cool things they do that much. <laughs> if, if your viewers aren't watching, I'm holding up my fingers. <laughs> <There's>, yeah. <laughs> um, the right scale and the right time frames. It, ha it can't be 50 years from now. And all four of those have to happen mm -hmm. to make actually lower our emissions. This is complicated. So I'm about setting up incentives that work in a way such as this, we'd like to see emissions lowered in this sector. Uh, go about it any way you wish. And if you're actually, I don't care if it's coal or whatever, if you can lower your emissions in some fashion, capture the carbon and put it away, 
more efficient coal power plants, you know, um, co-firing, whatever. Uh, then you can receive, you get some of the benefits of these incentives for the actions performed that actually had an outcome we're trying to achieve. Focus on the emissions, you know, not the money and not the fuel on the problem, which is the emissions. So focus on that. How can we collectively begin to reduce those? And then don't force fit one solution onto everybody. Mm -hmm. These electric vehicle mandates that are happening gleefully in about almost a two dozen states now, crazy talk. You know, <laughs> yeah, you have to have options in real markets. EVs work some places, but not everywhere, mm -hmm. even in those markets. So you're starting to see big time pushback in Europe even and in the U.S. on on mandating a solution that doesn't fit everything. It's politically popular for your voter base, but it doesn't actually fit and address the problem. So we, and we've seen that. It's always been, always will be, but we gotta be very thoughtful and careful about keeping track of mandates as opposed to looking at the problem and setting up scenarios and then letting different states and, and countries and industries and companies address those things in the ways that they can. If I'm correct. China builds a new coal plants on average once a week. So in terms of that and it being one atmosphere, to what extent do you think carbon taxes are just virtue signaling in Canada where it, it appears that you're doing something, but in reality, it makes no difference at all? Yeah. Oh, Look, I think everybody needs to think about how to contribute. So I, even though Canada is a relatively smaller economy, not compared to some, but relatively, so that impact won't be huge, but I think it's important everybody does some things. Uh, on the other hand, um, forcing that into a political set of solutions in which one set of voters appreciates the outcome and the other one is trying to figure it out and then a bunch of industries don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work. Um, and it's not just China. India is building lots of coal now. Bangladesh, Pakistan, Vietnam, Asia is building coal. So the reality in your terms of your question, the scale of those emissions, Asia alone produces more emissions than the rest of the world combined, including the U.S. and Europe. I mean, the whole rest of the world combined, Asia produces more CO2 now. And they're going up, everybody else is flat to going down in the developed world. And then the undeveloped world doesn't do hardly any because they don't have any <laughs> to speak of. So is it virtue signaling uh, kind of in a sense of real impact in the time frames that are needed? <laughs> Instead, I think Canada could play a great role in helping to understand some technologies that would work. Uh, Alberta is not Saskatchewan is not the east and west coast it's not quebec it's you know they're different energy resources different political systems and etc so different parts of canada could do different things and have some successful outcomes recognizing that the big energy production in canada is still from the interior of the country and that allows a lot of other things to go on across the country just like in the u.s and not to over focus on one thing only we talked about climate if you only focus on co2 you're going to have unintended consequences that are significant in other environmental space all right and we got to balance all that we got to really be very tactical about the co2 piece not to the exclusion of the land the air and the water or the economy these things all have to work together it's messy you know, trade-offs. There are trade-offs here between the in the real world between these different things. It's not going to be perfect by any means, but we can have success in all of them if we're willing to compromise and work together and address some of them. But it's not going to be perfect. Those who want no taxes and you know no regulation and just let me do my thing. Okay, well, whatever. Mm -hmm. And those who want government to pick and choose every winner out there because we know how smart governments are. <laughs> Mm -hmm. or whatever neither of those we've got to really get to that space in the middle where where thoughtful people are working hard to balance those i call it the radical middle it's have for years and years and years 
mm-hmm. it's that really tough space in there between the energy economy and environment, academics and governments and industries, and right in that overlap space where you're looking at data and and not agreeing on everything, and you're never you're not always right, but and it's humbling mm-hmm. to bring your humility to the plate, mm-hmm. but but that's where the big challenges lie. We got to work on them together. Another thing, Canada, maybe in the U.S. too, is we're spoiled. From a security point standpoint, we're not threatened in that. One point you made was that a lot of times actions speak louder than words. And when push comes to shove, inner security is really what countries look towards. In the case of Germany, they went right back to coal as soon as Russia cut them off. At the end of the day, how much does energy security weigh in and all, in and all this? It, it, maybe in Canada, we're lucky, but not everyone else is. You know, it's, it's a huge piece. If you look at climate security, energy security, economic security, leaders of governments and industries need secure energy and secure economies. That's why they're in, that's why they're there. Is to yeah. <laughs> secure the public of those things. Yeah. And their safety, right? So, I would say Canada's getting attacked a little bit, or at least your prime minister is for you know on the on the uh, military side, maybe not keeping up with the role there that everybody has to play a little bit of a role there too to keep the world peaceful and safe unfortunately i wish it weren't so but a recent attack this week says it is so and still so canada has important roles to play and a lot of people come to canada you're multicultural i started coming to canada in the mid 80s uh and and in calgary it was multicultural then it's, it's a phenomenally uh nice, diverse, educated, uh, resource-rich country. So there's a big role to play here by example of how to do these things well without going too far off into into government land or industry land or academic land, keeping in that tough inner space in the middle. Then then we can work that problem. And Canada has an important role to play there. But at the end of the day, it just seems like we said actions speak louder than words. And when right. it, governments are pushed into a corner, whether they are willing, willing to time. admit it or not, the fossil fuels will come out on top. Oh, yeah. Every time they go for the secure energy. Every time. Right. Yeah. Even Germany. You know, Germany, which is a very clean thinking citizenry, right back to fossil fuels. Yeah. Coal. So that's because it's secure, it's it's affordable and reliable, and you got to keep the economy humming along in order to be able to do these other things. And and, and some people might hear that as terrible. That's not terrible. Yeah. Think, you know, clean up the fossil fuels, capture some of those emissions, produce them better, always protecting water, etc. But it's not bad to have secure energy. This is a, this is a privilege. Okay, we mm-hmm. can take it away from ourselves. I mean, I have to believe, Trevor. This is meant to be kind of funny, but, you know, at the end of every day, I think, you know, Xi Jinping must call, you know, Vladimir Putin. And then he links in Mohammed bin Salman from Saudi Arabia, who calls up Modi in India, and they get on the conference call and they say, can you believe it? The West is still doing this and they're buying all our stuff and we're still burning coal. You know, and oil and gas and will forever, as long as we have it, this is our good fortune. And they yeah. sleep well at night and they get up the next morning and we keep doing it. So, I mean, that's a little dramatic image. But India and China and Russia and Saudi Arabia are very important players in this world of making stuff. All right. And mm-hmm. making energy that comes to the world are hugely important in this and what they're doing, watch their actions. That's how they plan to continue for a very long time. And each of them is run by a quote, well, not Saudi, but an elected official, right. okay. India, China, and Russia. Okay. So they've been around a long time, those elected officials, and they'll probably be around a long time to come. And it's important what they do. We got to be pretty sanguine and, 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 and thoughtful in our as we think about the role of the current 
NATO group, if you will, and, and, and how we're going to respond and react to all of that. Because we could find ourselves accelerating into irrelevance. Exactly. And that would make that would make some people very happy. <laughs> you think about this stuff a lot, recognizing some of the issues we've just talked about. One of them being that the quote unquote elected leaders of these countries owe it to their citizens to provide them with clean energy and recognizing all the stuff we just talked about that you basically know all about what do you think is the solution to this mix is it just pragmatic solutions for countries and reducing their carbon footprint where they can or is it what do you think is the best yeah. way to go about it i get asked this a lot unfortunately there's not a silver bullet or a single answer it is it does vary around the world but some components of that the physics would say we're going toward ever denser forms of energy. That's mm -hmm. just what drives eight, nine, and soon to be 10 billion people. So that would include nuclear, natural gas, and hydrogen at some level, oil, and then supplemented with other forms. You know, physics drives us that direction. Yeah. Economics drives us toward what's affordable. And again, You'll hear that solar and wind are more affordable. That's a certain measure called the LCOE or levelized cost of energy. That's at the generating source, the plant gate, if you will. Yes, they're very cheap now, but again, to get it to you and me, they've got to have that redundant backup and make some expenses. So still the cheapest, though they wouldn't be using it, is coal <laughs> around the world. Um, pretty remarkable fuel. And then natural gas in some places, depending on how much of it you have, and oil and how many shipping lanes you can open up, et cetera. Nuclear, once built, the nuclear electron is really cheap. And it's yeah. so efficient and dense. So economics kind of drives us that way as well. Again, supplemented, because not everybody has all those things. And then uh, when you start thinking about the environmental drivers, we use the word clean. All forms of energy have environmental impact. So the reality is we have to mine for everything to capture energy, whether it's a solar panel and a wind turbine or a, a pump jack and a drilling platform or, or a nuclear reactor. You, know, you got to mine for that stuff and then you make it and you capture energy and it wears out and you bury it in the earth and do it again and again. It's not renewable. Mm -hmm. I'm a geologist. I don't mind mining, but it's not renewable and it's not clean. Okay, so... When you start to think about the environmental impacts of mining and drilling and everything, they're real. So the environment drives us toward lower impact. Lower impact typically means less stuff, right? If I can, if I can accomplish the energy needs or, or satisfy the energy needs and demands with less stuff, that will typically have less environmental impact if I do it well. Again, interestingly enough, kind of driving us toward denser more affordable forms of energy. So in this big mix to lower the emissions, nuclear has to play a role, both at the large scale and the small modular reactor scale. Natural gas is going to play a role, and the hydrogen comes from that, however it's made from water or methane or otherwise. Oil is going to be around a long time. It's just so dense in a liquid form for our big machines, <laughs> be they planes or, you know, or giant trucks or whatever it is we need to haul around. The weight to energy impact ratio is good with gasoline and diesel and jet fuel. So it'll be around a while for that. Maybe less in the in the smaller vehicle space. Um, I think batteries will play a role. Smaller vehicles, scooters, two wheelers, three wheelers, and some small cars in the cities and that kind of thing. But not everywhere. Don't force them everywhere. That might work. Mm -hmm. uh, and then. And then you got to have more efficient uh, gasoline and diesel vehicles, and then hydrogen fuel cells and even compressed natural gas. So some optional blend of those different things are good hmm. in the transportation sector. Industrially, we can and, and we can continue to clean things up. You know, we are terribly inefficient. Better windows, better insulation, better lighting, um, time of you know meters in rooms so when you leave the room the lights go off and the air can be like in a hotel in europe brilliant the things that we can do that don't change our way of life and man they use a lot less energy so get a lot more efficient with our energy usage and more educated about it and we can save some things mm -hmm. and and then finally recognizing that 
it's not just good for the people who don't have anything. It's good for everybody. If the world's poor begin to get access to things and lift themselves from poverty, you see birth rates, fertility rates go down. You see environment get more protected. Consumption starts to get in balance, et cetera. So <clears throat> juggling the demand side with the supply side is critical. And we can do it. Some countries have gone pretty far down the supply side and picking winners. And I think they're starting to recognize it's not working. Costing a lot of money. It's not having the impacts they thought. Don't judge the intentions. Maybe the intentions were good. Mm -hmm. so let's say they were, but it's not working. So don't be too proud to reset. You know, we learned some things. That's knowledge. I'm a leader. I'm going to adapt and try something else. You know, we got to allow our leaders to gain knowledge and, and then change. That's, that's what learning is all about. It's not flip-flopping. It's called pro progress. <laughs> it gets harder. If I kept telling my, my kids are all grown and gone, I have four of them. I kept telling them the same thing and they keep doing the same thing. And I keep telling them the same thing, doing the same thing. There's no learning going on here as a parent. <laughs> Try a different strategy mm -hmm. and maybe you get a different result. So I think that's, uh, that's kind of where we are in the West right now. Is we're just starting to see a bunch of different of knowledge that these things aren't working that have been imposed, even though they had good intentions. So let's uh, let's adapt new strategies. Well, that's an hour. I think that's a pretty good place to leave it. We could talk for hours, but that's a good covering of the waterfront. I really appreciate your time. Trevor, it's been good to be with you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. If, and good so, luck with all you're doing. Good luck with the the ski uh, head distribution business and your own skiing. Yeah. Uh, that's terrific. I'm glad you're still doing that. Thank you. If somebody wanted to learn more about maybe a pragmatic energy future, I think you're at the Switch Energy Alliance website. Yeah, switchon.org. Switchon, one word, dot org. And all of our films and TV shows and museum stuff and classroom materials. And my slides, I speak a lot. My slides are accessible to people as well. So go there, check it out, take some things down and share them around. We're trying to really find that non-political point for people to access. Awesome. Well, we can end the formal conversation there. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Trevor.